in a world. Oh, we're recording. <laughs> All right. So, category theory for mortal programmers, um, and the reason for the title, because uh, some of us would actually like to grok this stuff in our lifetimes um, without actually having to obtain a PhD in abstract math. Um, if you Google category theory, um, you're likely to come up against this thing. Um, a monad is just a, mono a monoid in the category of endofunctors. So what's the problem? And I know we all had a prof like this in university, right? Now, disclaimer, speaking of university, I've only got undergrad maths, and I have, and that was 20 years ago. So, limit your questions to simple stuff, please. Um, so a little bit about me, you all know me, Stefan. Work at Pivotal Lab, Singapore. Shout out for the old Twitter feed there, at Beard Papa. And then the um, blog, which you may wish to visit, um, e even though it was last updated in November of 2015. Right. So what is category theory? Um, to, in, a, in as simple as terms as I could possibly explain it, I would start by saying that as so many things that we programmers love, it's an abstraction. Uh, uh, programmers like to work with abstractions. We like to think in terms of abstractions because it makes our jobs easier. It allows us to think about the, the larger issues without having to necessarily drill down into the details. Um, category theory is exactly that for mathematics. It's a branch of mathematics which was developed specifically to encompass really abstract thinking where the thinking is ordered at such a high level of abstraction that the things which is A, B, and C there, uh, they're called objects, can literally be anything. It can be a person, it can be a human being, it can be an object like a fan, um, or for our purposes, they're going to be uh, elements of our programming languages. Specifically for the purposes of this talk, I will be limiting our discussion to functional programming languages because that is where category theory is actually most applicable. People do apply function, uh, func uh, or category theory to languages like C++ and JavaScript. And if you're interested in that, you can actually find quite a lot of information about that out there as well. But we'll only be limiting ourselves to talking about um, functional programming languages. Specifically Scala, because it's the only one I know. So, sorry, Clojure and um, Haskell guys. Objects, anything. They are the A, Bs, and Cs in this little diagram. The arrows are called morphisms by category theorists. We can call them arrows. I will probably keep calling them morphisms because it makes me sound a lot more intelligent about this stuff than I actually am. So, the blue bits are morphisms. They are directed lines between the objects or between the things. And next slide will give us immediately, I'm just going to jump into how this stuff relates to programming. Because that's really what, what we want to know, right? So for our purposes, a thing, um, if A and B, A and B are types for our purposes. Um, F is a function with an input A and an output B. So F takes, takes a parameter A and returns something of B. G, takes a, G is a function that takes an input of B and returns something of C. And then G following F, that little notation at the bottom of the screen there, this is a special mathematical notation that category theorists like to use. G following F, which will make sense in a minute because it looks like it should be F, little circle or composition G, but it is actually correct to write it in this way because you'll see in a second that what it actually translates into is the composition of these two functions, meaning that you call the one and then you call the other. So when you say G following F, the way which we normally do this in programming terms is we 
call function f first, pass the output of function f into function g. And that gives us, gives us the composition which translates into a new function which takes an input of a and gives us a result in c. That bit at the bottom, this composed function, this is the thing that we're interested in. That is what category, but that is actually the thing that makes category theory interesting for programmers. One more thing, domains and codomains. The input is normally referred to as the domain, so A in this case would be the, the domain of the function, and for those of you guys who did numeric analysis in university, this should be um, familiar, familiar territory. Um, and the codomain B, same thing. So categories are, have a definition. So there's a standard definition of what would actually make something a category. Um, although it is a little bit abstract, there are specific rules which govern what can and can't be a category. And the reason for that is in the universe of, cate of category maths, same as with all other branches of mathematics, unless you lay down some rules, things start falling apart. And you can't really have firm um, proofs the way that you, you, you need this to be able to mathematically prove something, is you construct a little magical universe constrained within the laws that govern what, what is what. The little graph on the right hand side contains pretty much what everything that would constitute a category. Um, all of this, so very important to note, this whole thing is a category. It's not that A is a category, or B is a category, or C is a category, although they could be, but that takes the level of abstraction one level higher. We'll keep it simple. We'll just say that all of this stuff is a category, and for our immediate simple purposes, A, B, and C are primitive types, or maybe objects, um, an integer or a string or a sequence could be an A, a B, and a function would be an, an F or a G that takes the, those types as inputs. Um, a slightly higher level of abstraction, which I'll get to next, would be where we work with higher kind of types in functional programming, generic types or templates in C++, where you, temp, where you um, have a type constructor, meaning that the thing that you pass in to the, to the function is not actually a realized type, like a sequence in, in, um, in, in Scala, for example, or in Java. It could be a, a list of string, but before it's a list of type string, it would be a list of anything, right? That list of anything, that unrealized type, that is also something we're interested in. Now, if you haven't done functional programming before, you are maybe not aware of the fact that functions themselves are first class objects meaning that functions can be passed as parameters as well. For the purposes of category theory and for what we want to do, we want our A's, B's, and C's also to be functions, meaning that the input and output potentially of what we, of our functions F, G, and G of, and G following F, potentially also will be functions, not just necessarily data. Let's look at some of the definitions on the left-hand side of the screen there. You have the objects, in our category are A, B, and C. The morphisms or the arrows are F, G, and of course G following F, which I didn't write in. Then composition is a very important part of, um, of a category. In order for something to be a category, there needs to be, if you have an A that goes to B and a B that goes to C, in order for this to be a category, you must have composition in it. So the little inverted E there is my attempt at sounding again a little bit more mathematical than I actually really am. That, of course, is just the mathematical symbol for there exists. So given a function f that takes an input a and returns a result b and a function g that takes an input b and returns a result c, there should exist a composed function g following f that takes as its input a and returns a result in c. That is composition and that is a requirement in order for something to be a category. Then there is the identity of the, um, of the category, meaning that um, the identity function is 
defined as, um, as uh, um, an A. It's this little arrow right here. So it is the same as the F in the G there as meaning that it is a morphism or a function. It is just a function that takes an input A and returns an A. But very important distinction between the identity function and something that they call endofunctors, meaning I'm not going to talk about endofunctors. I'll talk about that later. Um, the distinction here and the important thing to note, if A is an integer, the identity function is not a function that takes one and returns two. It is a function that takes one and returns the same result, one. Meaning that it leaves the, the it's a function that when you apply it to your input, it, the input remains unchanged. That's what we define as identity. Now, these things are still all a bit abstract, and we're going to get down into the nitty gritty immediately after two or three more slides. <laughs> so, um, category laws, the associative law and the identity law. Again, these are just constraints placed on the branch of mathematics so that um, things make sense and so that we can think and reason about these things in a, mathemat in a mathematical manner. Associativity, familiar to all of us. It means that if I have a category um, diagram that is uh, as the one is on the, on the right hand side here, where I have uh, a G following F, a composition of a G following F, um, and then, so this one is in here just to, to draw a similarity with the one from before so that things don't get too weird. And then a H following a G following an F which is just nested function calls. You're calling the one function with the next function with the next function, right? So it's simple composition. This has to compose, meaning that if I evaluate H following G first and then evaluate um, uh, the, 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 the composition of uh, F, it should return the same, it should be the same and have the same effect as first evaluating H and composing that with the result of the composition of G following F. And then the identity law is just as I uh, previously explained, it is that um, the composition for, with identity works um, both if you apply the identity after or before the actual um, uh, 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 function. And or rather, sorry, let me start again. This is a composition of the function f with the identity function, right? So it is calling the identity function using with f as input or calling f with the identity function as input. Both of them, they should work both ways. And the reason that works is because f takes input as a, the identity function would take input as a and return output as a. So if f takes input as a, I should be able to, to pass um, if to, to pass the identity function as a parameter to f and the result of that should be the same as when I pass um, f into the identity function as input and the result of all of that should just be f meaning that the, re, the, that, uh, the identity function does not uh, mutate the, um, the actual composition in any manner. Are there any questions before I continue? Can you make this more real for me? Okay, we're going to get into it. So I've, I've laid these things down just so that we can have sort of a baseline with the graphs and the little bits, but that would be the end of, um, of, of, um, of, of, the, of, the, of the little graphs and the abstract bits. So for our purposes, it is really nice to think of categories as functional design patterns. The origin of these things um, since well, category theory was developed in the 1940s, but the brand, it only really became mainstream in the 1990s when the Haskell hackers realized that they don't really, since they don't have muta, uh, mutable state, um, everything is immutable, they didn't have a clean way of, of working with, with, uh, with mutable objects. And category theory allowed, allowed that for them. It allowed them to construct transformations that where you could take an object wrap it and, and uh, um, work on it as if that object or collection or whatever was mutated and then the result is the mutated version of the original thing that you worked with 
without having had to disturb that immutable original item, right? I'm going to show you guys something that's going to be very familiar to you. Doesn't matter which programming language you know, this thing is going to be very familiar to you. The function definition there is in Scala, but it is actually just as applicable to anything else. If I, and the question for you guys is, and you guys will know this immediately, if I wanted to apply a function which takes an integer and returns, oh, that should be um, um, the square, and returns the square of the integer that was passed into it, and I wanted to apply it to each of the elements to, of that sequence, what function would you actually construct in order to do that? Or what is the method that you would call on the sequence? Yeah. Correct. So pretty much every programming language these days, Ruby, Python, uh, most of them have a map method, which oh, allows you, sorry? JavaScript. Yep, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. They have a map method which allows you to pass in either a lambda or uh, an anonymous function that um, will operate on each of the individual um, um, terms in, in place and return you the uh, either a copy or a mutated version um, of the of the original um, uh, um, sequence that you have applied it to um, and yeah map is the correct answer we're going to jump straight into an actual implementation of a category this is a very special category and it's called a functor and now I suddenly have a, a sinking feeling that I've actually uh, skipped over something here which was important um, and <laughs> okay, um, I'll explain. I'll, ex I'll, I'll run through the code. Is this is that legible, or should I bring up the IDE? Can you can you guys read that? I, I could also I could also just is it okay? Yeah. Okay, all right. So. With the laser pointer, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, I should have made sort of like an animated bullet thing that went through it, but <laughs> right. So. We are defining, um, let me first explain what it is that our objective is here. The objective here is, um, or our use case is, we have this thing called, or this type called a my box. A my box um, can contain any other type. So you can have a my box of string, or a my box of integers, or a my box of swayams, um, anything, right? Um, <laughs> Um, it could be a future. It's anything, anything that contains something else. An option, a future, a yeah. sequence. Yeah. Anything that contains something else. In our case, I've specifically made it a my box. It does not con it's not a collection. It holds a single value. That value is the same as the type of the, um, of the, the, the type constructor. Right? So my box of T, um, is, that's the full class definition in one line in Scala. Right there. Um, it's nice and uh, concise and to the point. We've constructed a, um, a, 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 it's not a realized type, right? This is a type, this is a definition of a type. My box, so now I'm going to define a map function. And this is the interesting thing. Uh, the, the first thing that you'll notice is that there is a direct correlation between the map function. The map function is sort of a, um, a, a commonly used word and can be used interchangeably for the category of functors. So there's a category, a mathematical category called a functor, and in programming, um, people have just started using the map method as interchangeable and as sort of the defined uh, method to call anything that is actually a functor. Well, uh, flat map and the rest of them have equivalence as well. For a functor, this is called map. The method is called map. So what does my method definition there actually say? Well, I'm defining a um, uh, a, a method that takes, um, or it's a, a typed, a uh, parameterized um, uh, method that takes a function, and that's an anonymous function, f, that takes input a and returns output b. And the function, so that's the first parameter. The first parameter is a function with that shape. The map method itself returns a function in this case. And the function that the map method returns, so let me just quickly check if I, no, I did not. I thought that I added in the, I think I accidentally deleted it. I added in the, the, the general shape of the thing that I'm talking about there. That's why I was saying something got left off. Anyway, 
I'll try to make this clear without. So this this is the bit that that you should pre please ask questions because this might might easily go over your head, as it did mine for so so many hours. <laughs> the um, so again we have a map, a map method. It takes uh, as the first parameter input a function. It returns um, another function, and the function that it returns is uh, my box of A. Um, as input and a my box of B as output as the return value. The implementation of that method is that it um, uh, the, the 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 way that it, the, what it actually returns is again the first parameter is just the definition of the of the um, of the my box A, but then the return type it actually applies the function that was passed into the map method to the value of the first parameter. The thing and inside the box. Right. So the thing inside the box is getting transformed. Now what this actually allows us to do, and, and the reason why, why this convoluted thing without, a, without an explanation has been constructed, um, I'm going to back up quickly again and talk about the fact that, let's say you have, a my, uh, you have a container that has something in it, in our case a string, and you want to get the length of that string out. Yeah. But you don't want to go and peek into the container. In fact, let's assume that you can't peek into the container to go and look at the thing that you, need to look, that you want to know the length of. Okay. Right? Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to use this functor category, which will allow us to obtain the value of, the, um, of, of, of that we're looking at but the value will be wrapped inside the same type as what we actually passed in. As if our whole universe were only allowed to really work with my boxes from the outside. They That's correct. They have values in them, but they're opaque. Yes. But maybe I could look inside what I have, but I can't call methods on it, right? I can only look at the pure value of it if I wanted to treat it as an opaque box that has a value. Yep. So I can't go in and push the button that says, give me the length of this string. But I have something here that will do that for me and give me a new opaque box that if I look at it, has the, the length of it in the box. Precisely. That's, new That's right. That's right. So that is what we are doing here. We are actually constructing um, a function. So the map method here will be slightly different to the map method that you are used to. The map method that you're used to would actually already return you the, the wrapped value of the, of the my box, right? The map method that we are actually implementing here, and I'll explain why it's implemented this like, like this in this naive example, um, is returning us a function that will give us the eventual result. So the function that is returned will have to be called again with an actual MyBox instance, which it will then calculate and compute. The, it will wrap whatever it is you pass into it. Um, which is where we, which is the next line there, create a boxed value. So our boxed string, now we construct a boxed string, which is an actual instance and of, a, of a string. And it has hello world inside, and it's a my box of type string. What do we want back? We want a my box of type int, meaning that we want the length of that string. So what we want back is eventually a my box of type int. So what do we do? We create an instance of the function we want to apply. And the function that we want to apply is a function that goes from string to int. And this function is going to be called raw length. It's going to take a string as an input, return an int as, a, as, a, as, a, as its output. This function is then going to be used to construct a transformation. And the transformation, so we are working on several levels of indirection here. Um, and this is where it normally gets difficult to follow along, and it's also why your map function in your, um, in your library will just return you the thing that you asked for without you necessarily having to construct all these several different levels of indirection. Now again, I will explain in a minute why in this naive example we are doing it this way because um, all these things are normally hidden by the library for you, but they're actually important when we reason about our categories. So a transformed length uh, is going to be a new function, which is the function that the map actually constructs for us. So the map method now will take as its input a function, 
um, in, in this case, it's our row length function, right? So we construct a new uh, uh, object or method or value in this case, all of which are, by the way, um, equivalent in, in this instance, um, since it's Scala, called transformed length of. And transformed length of is now the final function which will take as its input a my box string. Note that we're going to pass the box string into it and return us the my box of value int, which is the, um, the, 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 the thing on the left hand side there. If we were pairing and I said, instead of the name transform length of, I want to call this the result of the map of raw length of, I want to call that variable uh, length of boxed value. Would you say that made sense? Or like, because that's what I'm thinking of what transform length of actually is. It's a thing that specifically is going to do, uh, it works on boxes, right? Because map is specifically bound to, to handle boxes. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I wouldn't quite follow. Okay, our definition of map above, yeah. it only works with this class my box. Yes. Right? So I kind of feel like raw length of is nice because it, it, well, I guess he only works with strings. I'm just thinking like transform length of doesn't tell me that I can only use this function with box things. Oh, absolutely. So um, now one thing to, to note about this naive example is the fact that all of this stuff can actually be hidden inside my box. So they've been, they've been pulled outside of my box right now. Okay. But what I could actually do as, a, as a, a next version of the implementation, for example, would be to take, uh, to, to, to put all of the stuff inside my box, to actually make map behave in the way that we're all used to. And meaning, these are just the implementation details. And these are just the okay. implementation details on the inside of it. Okay. So, that the, so that from the client code point of view, it doesn't, it becomes simpler. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Right. So I want to recap the functor because, and I think actually that this slide should have been the previous slide because it kind of, it would have been a lead in, but I've left off the left hand side of the stuff there. But uh, we can go back if you guys have have more questions about this. The general shape of a functor is is what is um, on the first line there. It is. The transformation that you're trying to figure out when your client code will be, pre will be presenting a function that takes input A and output B, you always, in order for you to construct a functor, need to figure out how to the function, the map function that you want to construct or the mapping function, whether it's hidden or not hidden, will have the shape of the thing on the right hand side, meaning that it will be the type that you, that you um, of, in our case, my boxed value or my box, the type of a, a function that takes the type of a as its first parameter and returns the type of b as its second parameter. This is sort of, um, this, is, this, is a, this is a definition, this is a law, this is the definition of what a functor is. Um, it is not, th there are other shapes and that's why they're called design patterns. Because the, the shape for uh, the flat map is actually a monad. And there are specific, and, and no matter what you need to do or, what it, or how you want to reason about the categories that we're working with, that general shape will always be the same for all functors. Every functor that you ever, all map operations always have the shape. Meaning that you always have a function that you want to pass in um, that has the the, 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 the types A and B, and then the internally, either you yourself have constructed it or the library has constructed it for you, there will be a function that looks like what is on the right hand side of that arrow. It will first create a typed uh, um, function or a parameterized function that takes as its input whatever type it is of A or whatever type and returns whatever type it is of B. And just to bring it back to category theory again on the next line there, um, the category here goes from A to B. And what is on the left-hand side of the category, the object on the left-hand side here, is actually the function. Because remember before I, was specific, I wanted to specifically mention the fact that uh, functions are first-class objects in, object, in uh, functional programming, right? 
So the function on the left hand side is, uh, is the, the object A and that function can actually be further decomposed into a category of its own where the A and B's are a string and an int. But at a higher level of abstraction at this point we are talking about a A and B where the left hand side, the A, is a function with that signature and the right hand side for our implementation is another function with the, um, with, with the signature that you see there, meaning input of my box string, output of my box int. The if, our morphism, or our transformation in this case, is actually the map method. And that, again, is what makes, it, makes this a uh, functor. Uh, yeah, Diego, question? Trying to rework this. Uh, so the left-hand side of the general shape is like, if I would call that an operation, then the functor would be something, a function that takes an operator and creates a map method, so to say? You implement the map method. The map method is what the, 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 either the library or the programmer has to implement in order to provide the transformation that's on the right hand side. Yes. So, so the, the functor is, so you spit out map methods that take out the, the operations on each one of the... Precisely. So the, yeah. So your, your, the result of the map method will always be another function in this case. It's a function that, again, needs something to be applied to it. And typically, the thing that you apply to it is uh, uh, the function, uh, uh, some sort of a function in the shape of the thing that's on the left-hand side. But, you have, but that's normally left up to you, because each individual instance tend to be um, the same. The functor implementation for uh, applying a map operation on a sequence of objects we'll need to iterate over those objects and construct a new sequence in order to construct the return type, which will be, for, for example, if I wanted to go from a, a sequence of, um, like the original example where I had a sequence of integers, mm -hmm. and I wanted to, to, um, to, to, to square each of the integers in place, I would have to iterate over them. I would still return a sequence of integers, but they would now be squared. I could just as easily have returned a sequence of strings from that. Any more questions or any other questions about exactly what, what's going on here with the, with the functor? So in my head I see map, but I, what I say in my head is make me a map function, make me a mapper. That's right. Okay, so we're almost done. I wanted to, to keep this as, as small and simple as possible. Um, the monad has a similar shape to the functor, meaning that, um, again, we can think about this and reason about this as uh, um, something on the left-hand side that goes to something on the right-hand side. Flat map is the monadic operation that is implemented pretty much everywhere. Uh, the shape of the thing on the left-hand side for, for, for flat map is always like, it looks, always looks like that. It's a function that takes as its input A and returns something that's wrapped in a B. Sorry, something that's wrapped in a T. A something that wraps a B. A T that wraps a B. Yeah. Right? And the transformation that you want to implement, the, the, the function, the, the, the transformation function that you need to implement, looks exactly the same as the transformation function for the functor. In fact, the functor, the, the monad, the applicative, the thing on the right hand side always looks the same. The thing on the left hand side always changes. The and think of it in this way. The thing on the right hand side is an intermediary step. It's the transformation function that you need to construct in order for what you are working with to be similar types. Once, you, once you're working with similar types, then it becomes much easier for you to, 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 to compose things. Mm -hmm. um, and this is simply because same things compose easily, different things compose difficultly, or not at all. Functions are notoriously uh, um, um, difficult to compose, some of them, because the composition sometimes does not actually do what you think it would do, and sometimes it will fail. Okay, I've got a bunch of references, and I'm now open to questions. If there are any gaps in anything that I've said, please ask me now, so that I can explain a little deeper. Both. You want me to dig into monads? 
Oh, we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> basic um, um, instance of why I think this is useful. The, the, the map, flat map, and all these different operations um, that have been defined on the standard library have been defined on a bunch of different things. You can map over a future. You can map over an option. You can map over a sequence of things. And obviously, the implementations of these things are different. Right. But if you understand the general shape of what the map actually tries to achieve, then, you will then it becomes immediately obvious what the thing you're working with should end up as or how to end up using it. So if you understand, if you have a general understanding of, of, the, of the, 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 cate the categorical shape mm -hmm. of, for example, of the functor, of the map operation, right? Then it becomes obvious that what is actually happening, let's take the, the, the example of an option. Um, it's easy to reason about the fact that a sequence might, might have map. But an option which can either be none or have an actual value, an optional value um, in, in Scala, if you think of what the map operation does to that, it, it does exactly this, which is that it first transforms the, 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 um, in the implementation um, over here, for example, in our implementation of the map method, right? The function that needs to be returned here on the right-hand side will either return the, um, the, the value or it can check for whether or not, it will internally check for whether or not there is actually something to return and then return the none value for you in, 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 in its case. Which is why I can use map on an option as if, instead of an if statement. Right. It behaves like an if statement. Forget so that, that behavioral nuance becomes obvious once you understand what the uh, the general class of, um, of, 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 of functional shapes or design pattern, or what the, de the design pattern looks like underneath. Um, the same for future, or um, uh, in the case of flat map, um, the fact that um, the, the, for, um, the for construct in, in, um, in uh, um, Scala behaves uh, like a sequence of flat maps that are, that are evaluated um, either one after the other or in sequence depending on whether or not you're passing values back and forth. They're either, comp you're either composing, composing the, the flat maps one with the other or running them in parallel depending on, right? So um, that becomes a little bit more obvious and, and um, yeah. Okay, so again, it, that comes back to your statement that these are really, these are functional design patterns. Okay? So there's immense value in the understanding ah, the functional design pattern says I can take Because uh, one of the things, for example, remember we had the, the, the problem that I was trying to solve with the, um, the functional composition of the domain model, yeah. where we ended up um, needing a lens. Yeah. Well, we didn't end up using a lens, but it ended up, I ended up learning a lot as a consequence um, about this stuff, and that's why I ended up digging into category theory, was um, the lens looked interesting, and I knew there had to be a way. Somebody came up with this as the consequence of the same problem that I had. They needed to look deeply into something that they didn't have access to, a wrapped value that was nested three levels deep, right. and they wanted it to be um, uh, easily accessible. Um, and I guess that uh, libraries like Scala Z take a larger domain of, uh, of, of functional patterns and have wrapped them within a library, um, and uh, um, most of those things are actually monadic, monadic operations, so yeah. So have you read the book 
um, introduction to category theory that you recommend it? I have. It's extremely dense. I haven't read all the way through. I read the bits that I needed in order to make sense of what was going on. Okay. It gets, so the, the field of category theory is vast. And it gets extremely abstract very quickly. Um, uh, like mind-numbingly abstract. It's, 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 um, it's, uh, it's serious, serious reading. I think that I've read pretty much as much as I, I want to read in that book. Um, uh, it, it's a Kindle, Kindle book, otherwise I would have passed you my copy, but um, if you have a Kindle account, I can, I can lend, you, lend you my copy. Yes? So I'm just trying to understand, completely drop the concept of category three. So from what I understand, most functional, uh, functional patterns can be considered as a category, right? Is that correct? So um, could you make it more clear by giving me an I would say the other way around. I would say that um, these, so a functor is a category. A monad is a category. And these can also be considered as functional design patterns, rather than the other way around. So give me an example of what's not a category. Something that wouldn't be a category would be something that doesn't compose. Um, I would say any, any method that relies on state would cease to be a function in the first place. Right. And you can't use any of that. Right. So it ceases to be a pure function. Ceases to be a pure function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, one, of, one of the interesting examples that I saw is if you just, and this, this relates to, 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 to monads, is if you just think of, um, of first uh, what monoids are. Monoids are the same things. They're a bunch of A's. So if I have this, <laughs> if I have the set of all things that can be in A, and in this case, I'm going to say it's the set of all integers. That means one, two, three, four, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, a monoid is basically a binary operation that operates on two things in a set, meaning that um, I, can, I can add these two things together, right? So addition um, is, a, is, a, is a monoidic uh, operation that I can apply there. Uh, and remember before when we were saying that our A's, our B's, and our C's in the category. In this case, they would be ints. Yeah. So that would be an int. This would be an int. Because it composes, but minus or divide would not. Right. Minus doesn't compose. It does not compose. And remember that in, in, in order to figure out whether something, whether or not something composes, we have to go back to our composition laws, right? Mm -hmm. So if we evaluate in terms of um, the, the law of, asso of associativity, um, does does plus um, uh, evaluate associatively? In other words, if you have a, a function that, that uh, operator that adds things together, one plus two plus three, that composes, right? Um, it composes because that result is exactly the same. It doesn't compose because this doesn't provide the same result as this. So minus, minus, sorry, I need to put one yeah. operator. Minus does not compose because the order in which you evaluate um, the, the, in which you're, and the minus here would be the monadic, the monadic operation, which you're trying to evaluate whether or not it is, uh, whether it composes. Um, so that is an example, the minus operation here, of something that does not compose. The same holds true for functions as well. Uh, functions on certain types of input compose. Functions on other types of input do not compose. And it's those edge cases where functions on types of input that you're interested in do not compose that you want to go and build your specialized transformation function like a flat map, which make them compose. And that is, that is sort of the, the interesting part where, uh, of, of monads, that you can actually construct your own monads that allow your own types to compose once you figure out that they don't compose. The other one is identity. Right. Uh, for instance, you would think multiplication is associative and therefore for any integer uh, it should be at a category, but zero screws this up because zero times and the identity function, which is one in this case, zero. is actually zero. So it's, uh, and zero times seven is also zero. Right? So in fact, you can't include zero in your uh, set of objects. So if you take zero out and just have one to infinity, then it becomes. Any other questions? Is it a wrap? Can you send around those links on the slides? I'll, I'll send the slides around.